Well, good morning to everybody. Let's turn to Nehemiah chapter 1. And you want to pick up where we left off with Ezra. And the series now will lead into the life of a new character, a man called Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah will come to Jerusalem around 14 years or so after Ezra has come to Jerusalem. So when we end Ezra chapter 10 with that dealing with by Ezra of the sins of the intermarrying of the uh, pagan wives and the Jewish men, the incident in Ezra, Nehemiah chapter 1 will take place about 14 years or so after that incident of chapter 10. Now, Nehemiah is a man of prayer, but also a man of action. And he's a man who's not indifferent to the needs of his people. He's a man who cares deeply about God's honor and God's people and God's glory. And he's a man that in just 52 days will rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem. So he's a man of prayer, sure. And we'll see that particularly in this chapter one. But we'll also note as we go through this book that he's a man of great action. And you have to be both. You cannot be just simply a person who locks yourself away in a closet to cry unto God. You've also got to go and live in the world around you. If you remember in Matthew chapter 5, the Lord Jesus Christ, having told his disciples in the first 10 or 11 verses or so that they have to be people who are meek, people who are peacemakers, people who are pure in heart and hunger and thirst after righteousness. He then says to them, you also have to be salt and light in the world around you. And you have to go and integrate and interact with unbelievers in a way where they see Christ in you and you reflect the love of Christ. And this man did a great work for God. And when you study the life of Nehemiah, you have to be impressed by this individual. Now, who was Nehemiah? We're told in verse 1, he's the son of Hak Aliyah. We really know nothing about him apart from his father's name. That's really the background we have of this man. We also discover that he's the king's cupbearer who works in Shushan, the palace. Now, in such a place of honor and significance, Nehemiah was clearly a very trusted individual. The king's cupbearer was the one who was trusted to taste the king's drink before he took it. And of course, in those days, they were very worried about assassinating the king by poisoning. And whoever was placed in that very, very trusted position had to be a man of integrity, a man of significance, give you access to the most powerful man in the world at that time, intimate access, personal access. And a man who, although he was a foreigner, as a Jew living down in Persia, he had risen to the very top in Persian society, in the estimation of the Persian people, so much so that the king trusted him with his life. And he was given this very honorable position. Now, Nehemiah, when we meet him in chapter 1, is in the exile period, uh, or certainly among the exiles down in Persia. Now, that meant that from the destruction of Jerusalem to the incident in Nehemiah chapter 1, 140 years had passed. So we have to assume that this man was born maybe a fifth or sixth generation Jew in exile in Persia after almost 150 years had passed since Jerusalem was destroyed. We have to assume then that his first language is Persian. His culture that he grew up in is Persian. He, he's almost, we could say, Persian on the inside and Jewish on the outside. That's all he has is a very token Jewish identity, having lived five or six generations now down in Persia. A bit like maybe a Singapore Chinese who's five or six generations uh, 
left the land of China. You would see yourself as almost so Singaporean that there's very little connection left to the land of China. Well, this is what's happened to Nehemiah. His ancestors have been taken into captivity 140 years previously. He's down in Persia and he may know some Hebrew. He may be able to have conversational Hebrew. He may be able to read the Bible in Hebrew, but almost his whole upbringing has been in the Persian culture and language and ways. And he's been influenced by the Persian values and religious systems. But the wonderful thing about this man, Nehemiah, like Daniel, is although he lives in a foreign pagan culture, he never lets that culture get into his heart. His heart remains fixed and rooted to the rock of ages. And Jehovah is still his God, his only God that he worships and he serves. Now, to hold such an honorable position, such a prestigious position, not only would he be a very trusted person, but he would be a man as a foreigner to hold such a position. He must have been very cultured, very well-mannered, a man who was meek, a man who had great integrity, a man, no doubt, that was very handsome and cultured and educated, a very discreet man, a, a man that people looked at and admired and looked up to. And as the king's cupbearer, he had access to great privilege, and great power and great wealth. And no doubt many would have said to him, don't ever leave such a position. And certainly don't ever leave it to go all the way back uh, that long journey of many months to Jerusalem, that dangerous journey, and identify yourselves with those poor, downtrodden handful of Jews living in the land of Israel. You've made it to the top in the big country, in Shushan, the palace. But Nehemiah is a man you'll discover as we go through this story, who never hides away from serving the Lord. In fact, when, although he may be a cupbearer and a very cultured and a very educated man, he's happy to give it all up to make the long, dangerous, and uncomfortable journey back to Jerusalem and there identify himself with the people of God there and then to get down, as we would say, into the dirt of that rundown city and be a builder, and be a warrior, and defend his nation, and lead his people to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now, no one else has a plan to do the rebuilding of the walls, but God has a plan, and God has a man. And one of the things you'll discover about the work of God down through the centuries, that God's never caught out by events. There's no crisis in heaven. God always has a plan and God always has a man in every generation to do his work and to do his will. The generation before Nehemiah, it was Ezra. It was Zerubbabel, Joshua the high priest. The generation before him, there was Daniel, and Ezekiel, and even before them, Jeremiah. And every time God has someone, and even the generation before him, God raised up Esther for such a time as this to preserve the Jewish remnant down in Persia, in the Persian Empire. So as you study the history of the Jews, as you study the history of the church, as you study the history of the world, and you look at the turbulence in world events around us, and we see the war in Ukraine, we see the banking crisis now exploding, in different parts of the world. And people are saying, where's God? What's going to happen next? Well, as you study the book of Nehemiah and the other parts of uh, the scripture, and you study world history, you will discover this about God. There's never a panic in heaven over the affairs of men because God always has a plan and always has a man, or we could say, has men and women that he will use uh, 
in his time and his way to forward his work. Now, the day began for Nehemiah in verse 2, just like any other day. He went to work. He got up. He prepared himself for work. He went to work. And he began to serve in the workplace. But you know, often God steps into our lives on days that we don't expect anything to happen. If you remember, King David was just a shepherd boy on the hills of Bethlehem, taking care of the sheep, faithful, courageously, diligently. And then one day he got a call. Your dad wants to talk to you, David. And his father called him in and he said, David, today you're not to go to the sheep. Send someone else. You're to go to the battle and see how your brothers are and see how the battle is going. And that day that David left home would change the trajectory of David's life forever because that would be the day that he would go out to face Goliath. He didn't know that. His father didn't know that. In fact, nobody knew it. Goliath didn't know it. King Saul didn't know it. Only God knew it. But it didn't begin with, welcome David to this day. Today is going to be your giant slaying day. It just began for David just like any other day. The same for Joseph. That day he got up, went to work in his father's business, in his father's home. And his dad called him in and says, I want you to go and visit your brothers down in Goshen, down in Shechem. And that day would change Joseph's life forever because when he would get to that place, away from home, he would be sold as a slave down into Egypt. And for the rest of his life, the next 90 odd years, Joseph would live and be married, bring up children and ultimately die down in Egypt. And for Nehemiah, the same, he just gets up just like the day before and the day before that and goes to work. But God had a plan to change the trajectory of Nehemiah's life that day because we're told Hananiah, one of my brethren, came. He and certain men of Judah. Notice what happens next. It says, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. Here's Nehemiah actively seeking out the welfare of his people. He's interested in others. He's not a, a man who's got to the very top and he doesn't care. He's not interested. He, he's just seeking to maintain his power base, his fortune and his powerful position. No, these men came in and Nehemiah immediately, he wants to find out what's going on. How is my brethren? And you know, this man, Hananiah, is probably, in our minds, not a very famous person. But his faithfulness in coming to Nehemiah and then delivering this report to Nehemiah will be used of God as a hinge of history. It'll, it'll turn the door of the history, not just of the Jewish people, but the history of this world. Because when Hananiah, Hananiah gives his report, it's not going to just change Nehemiah's life, but it's going to change world history. Because it's going to be used of God to rebuild the walls of that nation and ultimately prepare that city, the holy city, for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. Nehemiah, he says, to them, what's going on? What's happening? Let me ask you a question. Are you interested in others? Not, not interested because you want to gossip, but are you interested in the welfare of God's people? Do you love to hear the missionary reports? Do you love to read the newsletters? Do you love to hear in the place of prayer at the prayer meeting uh, that so-and-so is serving the Lord and God is blessing and God is using? Do you love to listen and hear, is there a brother or sister that I can help, that I can pray for, uh, that I can show love for? Or do you say, well, I'm very comfortable with my life. Just don't disturb me. 
Don't bother me. And I, I, I won't, I'm not interested in what's going on in other people's lives as long as I'm okay. And you know, there's an awful lot of professing Christians like that. Do you remember Lot down in Sodom? He was so busy making money, so busy getting to the top in Sodom. He didn't care about his uncle Abraham. He didn't care about any other believers. He just was so taken up with the things of this world. And you know, when Lot was making his money and making his way up the greasy pole of success or so-called success in Sodom, the chapter before that, we discover Uncle Abraham was praying for Lot, was before God himself crying for God to save the city of Sodom and deliver Lot and his family. Lot wasn't concerned, wasn't concerned even about his own family, never mind anybody else outside his family. But Abraham was. And here this man, Nehemiah, what a concern he had. Straight away he said, tell me, What's going on in Jerusalem, the holy city, the city where Messiah will come, the city of salvation where the, the Savior will die? He says, what's going on there? In verse 3, he tears this terrible report. The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the provinces are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Oh, he hears sad news. He hears news of the remnant. He hears news of their reproach. And he hears news of the ruin of their situation. Now, a lot of people, when they hear this type of news, particularly in positions that Nehemiah was in, in safety, in security, in wealth, in power, in privilege down in Persia, would have just shrugged their shoulders and said, well, I'm sorry to hear that, but I'm too busy. Or some would say, well, that's their problem, not my problem. I've got better things to do. Others may even have said, well, we need to do something. I'm a powerful man. I'm Nehemiah. I have access to the king and uh, I've got a great mind and I'm respected and we need to form a committee and come up with some ideas how we can influence the king and take advantage of our position in Persia to help these people. And I'm sure there's many professing Christians listening to me. That's how you would have reacted when you hear of the struggles of the people of God. But Nehemiah doesn't do that. Notice in verse 4 how he reacts. And you'll see such a similarity with Ezra. It says, And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. His first reaction is to mourn. His first reaction is to identify with the pain of the people of God. His heart is broken. His heart is moved by their situation. And let me ask you a question. When you hear of bad news happening to God's people, whether it's persecution, whether it's spiritual failure, whether it's economic failure, whether it's church splits, or any kind of issue that afflicts the people of God in any part of the world, is your first reaction to feel sadness and sorrow? It should be, because that's the reaction that God wants you to have. That's the reaction Ezra had. That's the reaction Nehemiah had. And they fast. And I explained last time that fasting goes with prayer. It's the idea that you don't have even the time to eat because you're so burdened by the situation, that, that you don't even have time to deal with the necessities of life. You want to get to God. You want to intercede for these people. You want God to help them and uh, to demonstrate your sincerity and your, your priority in this matter, that you just put aside everything else. You're just so greatly burdened. And here, Nehemiah, it says he mourned certain days. This was not just a a couple of minutes where he said, oh, well, I'll just shake my head and, well, that's terrible. I'm so sad to hear that. And then quickly forgets about it and moves on to something 
more interesting, more favorable to the flesh. No, here's a man deeply, deeply burdened. And despite the fact, as I said, he was a very powerful, intelligent, cultured man, his first instinct when he hears the bad news like Ezra is not to lash out, it's not to speak out, it's not to make suggestions. His first reaction is to weep, to mourn, to grieve, and then take the matter to the Lord. And you see this all over the Bible. Ezra did it. You'll see Hannah doing it in 1 Samuel chapter 1 when her heart is broke by the fact that she's barren, when her heart is broke over the fact that she's been persecuted in her own home and hated by Penina and taunted by Penina and her husband doing nothing. What's her reaction? Take the matter to God. Go to the house of God and pour out her soul unto the Lord. Ezra did it. Nehemiah did it. We see Moses doing it. When his own family come against him, the Bible says he fell on his face before the Lord. When Nadab and Abihu and all the other groups rose up against him, Moses' reaction is, God intervene. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Remember the old hymn, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And prayer was the first instinct of Nehemiah. I remember an old preacher saying years ago, if you want to see a church succeed, if you want to see a church go forward, if you want to see a ministry achieve anything, if you want to see your business, your career, your family be blessed in any way, he said this, he said, go forward on your knees. Go forward on your knees. Well, that's so true. But then notice having wept and prayed, fasted. Notice the nature of his prayer because the prayer lasts from verse 5 all the way to verse 11. And the Holy Spirit records the detail of the prayer because he wants you and I to learn from this prayer. Not just the reaction of Nehemiah, but the action of Nehemiah. And he wants you and I to learn how to pray. This is a prayer that God delights in. This is a type of prayer that honors God. This is a type of prayer that moves the hand of God. So in the remaining of this message, I want us to look at this prayer and reflect on this prayer. And you'll notice that this prayer has a number of sections. You notice, for example, the prayer will begin with praise and worship. Then you'll notice in the second section that there'll be confession. Verse 6 and 7. So verse 5 will be part 1 of his prayer. It'll be worshiping the Lord. But then part 2 in verse 6 and 7, Nehemiah will take time to confess the sins of his people and his own heart and his own life. Then you'll notice in verse 8 to 11, Nehemiah will then lay the needs of his people before God, the specific requests, the petitions and supplications that he needs God to intervene now in and direct, give wisdom and grace in this matter. And you know, that should remind you as you see that structure of the Lord's Prayer because that's exactly how the Lord's Prayer is structured, isn't it? It begins with worship, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Begins in worship and praise about who God is and what God is doing and takes our thoughts upward from our needs around us. But then there's that section of confession. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then there's that section that deals with our needs. Give us this day our daily bread. 
Nehemiah's prayer is structured like that. There's three parts to it. And it's important that none of these parts are ignored. It's important that when you read this and be pray yourself, that you don't leave that out in your prayers. If you want to pray prayers that touch the heart of God. And look at verse 5 in part 1, the praise. He said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God. The word terrible has the idea awesome, awesome God that keepeth covenant and mercy in them that love him and observe his commandments. So Nehemiah straight away recognizes by turning to God in prayer that only God and God alone can help him and his people in this situation. That's what he's telling you and I. We need God. Now, if such a powerful, cultured, educated man needs to do this, how much more should you and I? And he's on his knees and he recognizes straight away that God is not limited by human restrictions the way we are. He was, you and I are, but God isn't. And Nehemiah comes to God, he calls him the God of heaven, the one who rules over the, all the affairs of men, the one who holds the breath of man in his hand, the one who the Bible says measures the universe in the span of his hand the one who owns the earth and all that's in it. In fact, he says in the psalmist, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It all is mine. All souls are mine, he says in the Old Testament. All belong to me. And Nehemiah comes before him and he says, you're the Lord God of heaven and you're the great and terrible and awesome God. And he begins to worship. And what he's doing by praying this way is that Nehemiah is lifting his own soul heavenward and he's building up his own faith before he makes these requests to God, these big requests. He's reminding himself what a big God he really has. You may have big needs, but you've got a God who's bigger than your needs. And Nehemiah is taking time to remind himself of who God is. And you know, that's the way God always encourages us. He never encourages us by saying, you're great, you're capable, you're talented, you're awesome. No, God always encourages his people by saying, I'm great, I'm powerful, I'm awesome, and I'll be with you. Remember when Joshua was afraid after the death of Moses in Joshua chapter 1, and he recalled having been with Moses for 40 years, what a man Moses was, what an educated man, what a meek man, a man who could speak to God with God face to face on top of Mount Sinai, a man who the glory of God would just come down and people couldn't even look at Moses because the glory was so great in him. The Bible says God made Moses a mighty man so that even in Egypt, the Egyptians feared him and the Jewish people, the Hebrew people feared him. And Joshua looked at Moses and he thought, I could never walk in his shoes. I, I could never be like Moses. I could never lead this nation the way he can. He did. And, and I'm a very poor substitute, inadequate substitute. And God came to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1 after the death of Moses. And he said to Joshua, be strong and of a good courage. Don't be afraid. And he says to Joshua, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Only be strong, courageous, Joshua, because there's nothing in Moses that made Moses great. Of Moses, it was all the grace and power of God. And Moses may be dead, but Moses' God is not dead. And here Nehemiah is reminding himself when he has to face this great challenge ahead and difficult days ahead and difficult moments ahead, he reminds himself how great God is. And you know, you have to do the same. The moment you get bad news, the moment you hear of difficult news for others, don't just go running into pray, prayer and cry for God to intervene. I know that's our natural instinct, but 
what we really should do is just take time, mourn over it, consider it carefully, and then become before God and say, Oh God, thou art the great God. And read the scriptures to remind yourself how great he is. And then having done that, go to the next step, confession, verse 6 and 7. He says, Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night. Oh, this man is completely burdened. He's fasting, he's praying day and night for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. And he identifies himself with the people of God, Nehemiah, just like Ezra did. And he says, our people have failed. Our people have, our nation has sinned against you. And he says to the Lord, I have sinned. I'm as guilty as them. I'm not more righteous than them. And what Nehemiah is doing here, he's recognizing the sins of the nation are corporate because he also is a sinner and he's part of that nation. And he's saying to the Lord, I need your purity. I need your cleansing. And the wonderful thing about prayer is this. If you come to God and confess your sins, listen to what the Bible says. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all, not some, unrighteousness. Do you remember when King David sinned? Psalm 51 reveals what he said to the Lord at that time of repentance. He came before the Lord, didn't come before the priest, he didn't come before a pastor. He didn't come before even Nathan the prophet, who, who was a great man of God in his own way. No, David knew the only person who can forgive me my sins is God. And he came before the Lord in Psalm 51 and he said, Wash me, wash me, and I shall be whiter than the snow. Wash me, and make me whiter than the snow. And he said, create within me a clean heart. He said to the Lord, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. He says, make me a holy man. Purify me. But then the third thing that Nehemiah does, and all of these steps are essential, and the chronology of these steps is important, but in verse 8 to 11, Nehemiah then comes to the Lord and he lays before him the need and the situation. And he says in verse 8, Remember, I beseech thee. Oh, you can't force God's hand. He just pleads, Lord, I plead with you. That's what he's saying. I beseech you. Have mercy. I can't ask for justice because we're sinners and we deserve to be punished. But God, I beseech you, have mercy. Hear the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though they were of you cast unto the uttermost part of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence, and I will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 30, and keep your finger in Nehemiah chapter 1. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, hundreds of years before, God revealed to old Moses before he died something about the character of God. And in Deuteronomy chapter 30, Moses, speaking under inspiration, speaks of what might happen if they're cast into exile because of their sins from the promised land. Now, they weren't yet in the promised land. They were on the border looking in when Moses preached these sermons under inspiration. And Moses in chapter 28 and then in chapter 30 says in verse 1 of chapter 30, just for the sake of time, we'll go to verse 1, 2. It says, And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and that now shall call them to mind among all the nations, whether the Lord thy God hath driven thee. So Moses, if you discover that you're driven out of the promised land because of your sin, the curse and the blessing, 
God promises to bless you if you serve him, but he promises to curse you if you turn from him. That's exactly what's happened to the Hebrew people and the Jewish people in Nehemiah's day. They had been driven out of the land. They'd been driven into exile. And now Nehemiah is living in that exile 140 years from the day that Jerusalem was destroyed. And he knows they're under the curse. They're under the judgment. But he knows there's something else. There's another promise. It says in verse 2, And shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, and thou and thy children with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God, verse 3, will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations, whether the Lord thy God has scattered thee. And then he goes on and says in verse 9, And the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thine hand, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy land for good. For the Lord again will rejoice over thee for good, as he rejoiced over thy fathers. And old Moses revealed this to them. And Nehemiah clearly read the scriptures and meditated upon the scriptures. And he took those promises in verse 8 of Nehemiah chapter 1. He says, Remember, I plead with thee, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses. What the promises you give to Moses that if we call unto thee, you will show mercy. You will bring us again back into this holy land. And verse 10, he says, Now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Now, what does he do? in this last part of his prayer, verse 8 to 11. Number one, he cites the promises of God. Now, don't you see the connection between effective prayer and the word of God, the two go together? And how you're to pray the right way is meditate on God's word, his promises, and then come and bring them to the Lord and says, Lord, thou hast promised this in your word, I need you to intervene. I need you to help. Now, practically where you are today, how do you pray the promises of God? Well, if you're listening to me this morning and you need God's help in your situation, or maybe you're just lonely and you, you say, I need to know God's with me. Take the promises of God's presence. You have said, Lord, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Lord, make that real to me. Lord, build me up. You have said, Lord, that you will build me up in the most holy faith. If I seek thee, I'll find thee. Lord, I need you to find me because I'm seeking you today. Maybe you're listening to me today and you're saying, I have a very difficult situation to handle in work, in the home, in my marriage, dealing with my children. I need grace. I need wisdom. Well, the Bible says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. And it says, and it shall be given him. You take that promise and you lay it before God in prayer and you say, Lord, you've promised this and I want to claim it. Lord, you promised grace. If we come boldly to the throne of grace, we'll find help. Lord, I need your grace. I need your intervention in my life, in my marriage in my relationships with this person or that person. Lord, I need you. And he cites the promises of God and he does it humbly. In fact, just look in verse 11, how many times he describes himself as a servant. You're the master, I'm the servant, but I need your help, blessed master. I need your intervention. And he's very specific in his prayer. Our people, the nation of Israel, they need your help. And I need your help to talk to the king. And he names the king. Grant him mercy in the sight of this man, this king, Artaxerxes. 
When you pray, just don't pray all over the place. Come before God with specific requests. Name the individual. Name the circumstances. And God delights to hear you asking him. Old Hudson Taylor said this, and with this I close. He said, it is possible to move men through prayer and prayer alone by God. It is possible to move men through God by prayer alone. That's what old Hudson Taylor discovered. That's what Nehemiah discovered. And before you talk to men about God, talk to God about men. Before you talk to men about God, have you not learned that lesson from Ezra and Nehemiah? Talk to God about men. And what a blessing you will discover from the story and the example of this man, Nehemiah. Now, next time when we look at this book of Nehemiah, we're going to see what's going to happen after Nehemiah prevails with God about men. He's going to then discover how his prayers will move the hand of God to move the hearts of men, including pagan men, including extremely ungodly men, how that just a simple prayer, effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man, the Bible says, availeth much. But we'll see that next time. But may God inspire you and teach you and edify you and correct you through this message today to take time to pray and to pray the right way. Let us pray. Father, we do thank thee for thy word. What a blessing it is to our hearts. What an instruction it is to our souls. What a nourishment it is to our spiritual character. We pray, Lord, that we will hear your voice correcting us and then redirecting us how to prevail with men. It begins by prevailing with God first. And before we talk to men about God, help us to speak first to God about men. Help us to be men and women of prayer. We thank you for Nehemiah. We thank you for his example. Help us to learn from it, be blessed by it. But then help us to walk in his footsteps. For we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen.